Welcome to Eye Contact. I'm Aidan Hanratty. Today we are talking to Dr. John Kanalopoulos about management of corneal complications after refractive surgery. Welcome Dr. Kanalopoulos. Thank you for having me. Corneal ectasia is one of the rare yet potentially devastating side effects of refractive surgery. What have we learned about factors predisposing to this condition? Well, it's, we're fortunate that uh, there are several years now that we've recognized this potential complication of working with lasers on the cornea. Uh, we can destabilize the biomechanical stability of the cornea and then induce an iatrogenic ectasia. Of course, within the spectrum is people that do have um, idiopathic ectasia, keratoconus, and were just not picked up at the time of the initial procedure. So this applies more in treating younger patients. So through the years, we've established uh, several criteria. Um, for instance, the uh, minimum thickness that we would approach to do, uh, for instance, a LASIK procedure, a smile procedure, or a for, uh, refractive keratectomy, a PRK procedure. Uh, we have now a milieu of uh, very sophisticated cornea diagnostics, um, starting from the traditional computerized cornea topography that was able, and still is, uh, able to give us a very nice representation of the anterior cornea curvature. This is key in picking up early uh, irregularities of the cornea curvature that may suggest there's predisposition or clinical manifestation of ectasia. Now, there's more sophisticated devices that uh, work through optical tomography of the cornea, and we've had the ORP scan technology 20 years ago. This has uh, progressed into sine fluke-based technologies that were able uh, and are very sophisticated now in giving us uh, almost 3D imaging of the cornea, anterior surface, posterior surface, thickness maps, and curvature maps. Um, and of course, uh, something that we've, uh, in our center here in Athens, have worked extensively with is anterior segment OCT that is able to, in a very simple way, give us epithelial maps, uh, which we feel are the first thing that change uh, and when a cornea becomes suspicious uh, for ectasia. Of course, the holy grail here is cornea biomechanics once we have technology that can, give, that can address and categorize the biomechanical strength of each individual cornea and what effect the refractive surgery that we're performing will have on this biomechanical stability. I think a very significant piece of the puzzle will be met uh, to paint the picture. Uh, but I think overall clinicians are aware that there's a limit uh, to what is the minimal cornea thickness and what is a normal cornea architecture. We've had uh, uh, certain criteria, how much tissue to ablate um, in uh, comparison to what is the total tissue that the cornea has and what is the left behind tissue in the stroma, how to better make cornea flaps that are not uh, unpredictable in thickness because this will throw away all the rest of the algorithm as far as uh, residual stromal thickness. And uh, I think what's very important is a, a very strong campaign among eye surgeons uh, that relates to eye rubbing. It is my uh, clinical experience that uh, inadvertently, uh, ectasia after refractive surgery is always associated with significant eye rubbing. Um, so it's very important to educate our patients that after they had a successful LASIK, after they forget about us, a year or two uh, down the line, their vision is perfect, they're functioning very well, there's no real uh, tangible reason to visit the uh, ophthalmologist or the eye care professional, uh, but they have to stay with the message that eye rubbing may change things, may destabilize a cornea that is just at the brink. Um, and I think uh, this campaign needs to go uh, from uh, our mouths into everybody who cares for uh, patients in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about interface complications such as infectious keratitis, diffuse lamellar keratitis, and epithelial ingrowth? Um, this is a very broad field. Obviously, it's a field that's very, very important. Fortunately, uh, in the 25 years that I've been performing LASIK um, in Europe and in, in the United States, we've seen uh, happily these numbers drop significantly. It's really a, um, a, an occasional patient that we'll see in the office that will come in uh, with epithelial ingrowth, um, diffuse uh, interface uh, keratopathy, DLK, or Sands of the Sahara syndrome, was something that was reported in the late 90s. Uh, I think we've become more sophisticated in using single-use instruments, uh, uh, better modes of sterilization, keeping out 
dead spores from certain sterilizers from our, uh, our field, decontaminating the room from potential dust, uh, plaster dust, if you may, uh, or any foreign body. So uh, DLK now is a very rare occasion. Um, I have personally to see a DLK case in over 10 years. Right. Um, infectious keratitis uh, is a significant uh, factor. Uh, I think it is the most important factor in my practice as far as um, gearing up all the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care uh, because obviously um, do no harm comes in place and whenever we have a procedure in the human body, we always open a small door for pathogens that live normally in the surrounding area to enter uh, into tissue that they would become infectious. Um, it is a very safe procedure. Any uh, cornea-based procedure for refractive surgery is now considered extremely safe. I'm happy to report that infectious keratitis is uh, uh, incidenced under one in uh, 5,000, okay. which is a very good number. And I think that this is due to uh, the diligence of uh, surgeons, uh, prep teams, uh, education of the patients, and of course, prophylactic antibiosis. Uh, we treat patients intraoperatively besides a betadine um, uh, swab of the eyelashes with uh, antibiotics that do cover the common pathogens that are related with infectious keratitis. Um, and w although the number is not zero, we would like the number to be zero, we always have to compare it with the um, other side of the spectrum, which is infectious keratitis related to contact lens use. Uh, contact lenses are extremely safe today as well, uh, but remain the major burden for cornea health as far as infectious keratitis compared to uh, refractive surgery. And in my opinion, although I prescribe contact lenses every day, there should be a disclaimer um, in contact lens use that underlines the potential risk for infectious keratitis. Same way we informed consent our patients for any possible mishap of a refractive surgery procedure. Of course. Uh, dry eye is still a common problem with LASIK. Uh, what have we learned about prevention and treatment? Dry eye is a very significant uh, factor and uh, uh, does uh, require a lot of respect and care from our behalf. Um, in, in my particular clinical practice, it is more prominent among female patients, which uh, to begin with, uh, have drier um, uh, ocular surface than the uh, corresponding male patients. So when it comes to decide of which procedure to perform, uh, in my clinical practice, dry eye is a, an important catalyst. Um, so for uh, amounts of myopia and cornea anatomy, the PRK will be a good uh, alternative. And if dry eye is an issue, the patient already has dry eye, we expect the eyes to be drier and the coming years, then uh, a surface ablation may become our first uh, choice. A LASIK is definitely associated with a transient exacerbation of dry eye. Uh, we've studied this, we've reported extensively on how to monitor this with anterior segment OCT epithelial mapping. We've even compared LASIK to SMILE with the original promise that SMILE would uh, show significantly less dry eye due to its uh, uh, different technique working uh, mainly under the superficial cornea nerve plexus. Uh, we found, and we reported this in the Journal of Cornea recently, that the two procedures are more similar than dissimilar. So um, we've, and we've reported recently the use of topical cyclosporin A as an adjunct to help patients who have significant clinical dry eye after LASIK or SMILE, uh, which uh, fortunately lasts only um, between three to six months after the procedure. But it's not a subtle entity. Uh, it obviously can affect the quality of life of these pe people. And I think that with proper treatment of other surrounding risk factors, such as blepharitis, um, such as addressing it and, um, and uh, caring for it early, um, has not been a long-term problem for any of my patients. Okay. I think dry eye has to be also uh, be considered in comparison again to um, the morbidity involved with contact lens use. And the majority of patients, e even those who have drier eyes, so to speak, at the end of the day, a year after the procedure, will uh, claim that their eyes are much more comfortable as far as dryness uh, than they were when they wore contact lenses. Right. But, but it is an important uh, area that I think deserves 
uh, significant informed consent and discussion with patients. Um, I think in my practice, it, it's mainly for female patients, which, which tend to be uh, almost 20 to 1 um, more symptomatic than males. Really? Um, but I think that we do have solutions now and ways to treat and, of course, to choose the appropriate procedure for the appropriate patient. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Kanalopoulos. Oh, thank you. For more information on this and related topics, please visit us at eurotimes.org.